I'm going to uh, I'm going to jump right in uh, here, and uh, you know, cross-platform and multi-screen print, uh, branding and programming. So um, you know, entertainment is no longer what we watch; it's about how we watch it. And the broadcast industry is discovering that TV shows, news programs, and broadcasting events are now a multi-screen experience on TV, IPTV, PC, console, smartphones, tablets. Uh, we're going to examine successful multi-screen programming initiatives. Some of them, virtual carpet bombs, have they written here, and increase the viewing audience and awareness by 100% plus, and some that are fully ad-supported and funded. Um, so, you know, the first thing I'm going to uh, direct is, you know, now that entertainment is a mix of lean back TV and lean forward multitasking desktops, walking on the fly, mobile, visual, and a coffee shop tablet sharing experience, how do you program all of these with intertwining entertainment options? I'll, I'll throw that to uh, Maria first, I guess. Great, right off the top. You know, we were just talking, when I first came into the broadcast uh, community in 1999, I remember thinking that television was very straightforward. I, I, my analogy was, was, you know, it's not like pharmaceuticals, you know, it's not that complex. And Stephen and I were just talking before the panel. It has gotten so complex at this point, um, starting with how you secure the rights, particularly in Canada, um, for all of these different windows. and and. and and even before that, defining a common language around what is a right uh, and understanding the difference between a mobile right that is over a cell phone versus a portable right that is via an iPad, which is essentially still broadband. Um, we're still at the stage where we're really getting to the point where we're understanding the language uh, of, of what it is we need in order to secure the right uh, terms for these con pieces of content. But for us um, at Chorus, we have th sort of three main buckets of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, demographics that we target. First one being our pay business, so that's our, our, our movie business, uh, and it includes HBO, and a lot of what we're doing there, we call it our premium service, it's a premium pay service, so what we're doing there for the subscriber is a lot more straightforward, it's we want to reach these guys however they want to be reached, so we're really aggressive in all of our rights that we secure uh, in the movie business uh, to make sure that that audience, who is a premium audience, gets what they need, when they need it, how they need it, so a lot of on-demand rights, a lot of VOD, thousands of hours of VOD, we're working with HBO in the U.S., um, uh, on how do we launch an on-demand offer here in Canada that would mirror their HBO offering in the U.S. Um, and then this, the, another one is the women's vertical where we have W Own, uh, Cosmo TV and W Movies. So the Own uh, channel which launched here in Canada last year, with that con uh, brand and content we secured a large bucket of digital assets so that we can do the same thing. So we're able to go to our BDU partners and say this isn't just a linear play, it's also a large on-demand play. play. Uh, and how do we make sure we're, we're servicing the needs. And then the, the final bucket is our kids' content. So Treehouse, YTV, um, uh, we're going to be launching ABC Spark uh, on Monday next week, so everyone needs to tune in for that. Uh, and Spark was our, our latest one, which is ABC's family channel in the U.S. Its international brand is Spark, uh, ABC Spark, and we secured digital assets along with that. And so the idea being when a channel and a show uh, launches on linear, that it's very much ready and available on demand the next day. Uh, the catch-up service is really key to that distribution, so we're really cognizant about uh, making sure we're, we're hitting on all these platforms, but it's, it's, a, it's a complex piece of work for sure. I mean, Janet, you, you bring a slightly different perspective from a, not only a U.S. perspective, but from uh, handling the distribution of the rights that Maria is purchasing. You know, what's your side of the story on this? Um, first of all, I have to declare I'm Canadian, even though you had to put in the U.S. perspective. Um, but yes, we are we are American-based distributor, and I completely agree with Maria's point about distribution. So we uh, act as a distributor mainly for independent films. Our consumer brand is FilmBuff. You can see us at FilmBuff.com, and we curate awesome, original, cool content, specifically for digital consumption. Um, we do sometimes use traditional media, but primarily we're looking at digital. When we started four years ago to be a distributor focused only on VOD was absolutely sort of odd and people couldn't understand it. Um, now probably some people understand it, but the very first thing that we did uh, was make sure that we had a full set of digital rights. 
because if we were going to be acting as a sole digital distributor, we and no one else could actually foresee the future and how the rights would happen, what was subscription going to mean, what was ad supported going to mean, what was transactional going to mean, what was wireless and mobile and how did those rights fit together. Since we were starting brand new fresh as a distributor and were acquiring films that had not previously been exploited, we didn't have to worry about the split rights and things that other established folks have to do and I'm sure make your lives really fun. Um, so we actually could just cast a really wide net on those rights and work to, on behalf of the filmmakers, to take that content and maximize revenue across any platform. So for us, when we're looking at a, a multi-platform strategy, it's what we do every day. We release between 8 and 12 films a month, and we're putting it on everything from, in this country, Netflix and iTunes and Rogers and other folks, to, in the States, Comcast and, and iTunes, Xbox, PlayStation, Hulu, everyone. So the full gamut and working to figure out what is the right in doing just in digital for you know, what's, a what's the percentage of free versus paid at that point? to teasing to get people to watch the content. So our marketing strategy is different from our distribution strategy. So usually the distribution will start transactional and will go through windows in a way that traditional windows would go like theatrical and then pay TV and DVD and so on. Our version of windows is tends to be transactional where you're asked to pay for it and then subscription then free. But when we're in the transactional window, we will of course be doing marketing on a number of the free platforms. So we'll be having clips or interviews or trailers or outtakes, and we kind of do those two strategies in tandem. Okay. I, and you know what, come back to Maria just for one moment, and, and also Stephen, in regards to you know, Cana producing Canadian content and then marketing that content, and when marketing your own shows that you're gonna be you know, launching, uh, Spark uh, as an example, you know, I find that uh, Canadian talent is really, it's not the same as the US when a marketing machine goes into effect. A lot of the time the talent or their show is marketed with your own media as opposed to outside of that realm. Well, you know, D David, following up on that, but also going back to your first question, which is how do you program across all the various formats? To us as a producer, we have to step one stage above that and say, why are we doing this uh, in the first place? And we have to do that with each. We're on all the formats. We're on all the screens. Uh, we do webisodes. We do apps. We do games. You know, we're very active in social media. We create Twitter accounts for all our characters. We're doing all these things. And the central question for us in examining each one of them is not an overall strategy that we're trying to and, you know, expand this audience or monetize this or monetize that. In fact, we believe if we tried to do that, we would fail. Our question is, is this activity going to engage the audience even more than the audience is engaged? And our core belief is that if we can spend every second of our day trying to create greater engagement with our audience, with our fans, that the money will follow, that the strategy will follow. And I'll just give one example of that. We started creating webisodes uh, back in 2004, and I believe we were the second company in the world to start doing webisodes who were doing uh, television series. Uh, but we were the first in the world to actually use all our main cast, main characters, main sets to do them. Now, why did we do the webisodes? It was not to make money. It was to have a way to reach out and engage with our fans online because we knew they were online. And we did things like ask them what they wanted the webisodes to be about. And we'd run contests and they'd say things like, we want a webisode where everyone in Degrassi is pirates. And so we'd do a webisode and every, we'd have great fun doing them. Uh, we weren't doing it because we thought we could make money from that particular webisode. We knew that down the road, if our audience was engaged, our broadcaster was going to order more episodes and we'd all be happier in the end. Now, um, after many years of doing this, we have a relationship uh, between Much Music and Playtex and ourselves where our webisodes are fully supported and uh, but it's done in a way that we still engage with the fans. We don't product integrate with Playtex. You know, we might slide in an occasional play on in the, uh, in, the, in the dialogue, but that's the extent of it. We are still reaching out towards the fans and telling the fans, you know, we've got this wonderful sponsor, Playtex, that is making all this possible, you know, so good for them. 
And the fans buy into that. We're not trying to slide one over on them. They are simply grateful to Playtex for giving this opportunity. And at the same time, Much Music runs it. And it's not run just online on the Playtex site or on the Much site or our site. It's, uh, the, you know, Much will run it on air in place of a commercial, and it becomes a, you know, a unified strategy. But we didn't mean it as a strategy. We meant it as a way to get engagement. We're talking about webisodes for a moment because there's, there's I mean, I, I think that's a great model. I mean, you take a look at some companies that have been incredibly successful in being able to use their content to tease towards it without monetizing the original freebie content that they're putting out. UFC is an example, the movie industry. Uh, using, you're looking at the advertising industry, Chris, because you've had a lot of success with this with Much and MTV, and being able to get branding to support the production of webisodes. You know, what do you, you know, touch base on that? I'll kind of connect together <clears throat> some of the things that have been said so far to bring us to that point. We've been talking about the kind of fiscal economic perspective on content when looking at multiple platforms. So it used to be buying broadcast and then it was buying broadcast and online and now we have multiple windows, multiple platforms. That's certainly one component. Uh, the other way of looking at digital and multi-platforms is what are the layers around the show itself. So without even thinking of the rights on a show, what is the social layer? What are the, the webisodes or ancillary content that sit around a show that can help create fan engagement? We're, what we know that, that, especially with a brand like Much Music or MTV, we need to be very active in investing in that space to make shows like Jersey Shore or Degrassi or whatnot have cultural relevance. Uh, the Jersey Shore cast, their Saturday nights kind of help as well too. But um, the, where, where we're finding a tremendous opportunity now in, in terms of webisode content or apps is that those things, uh, those, those additional layers are now becoming uh, the, the part of a show or a story that our consumer can touch uh, and can interact with. And so to an advertiser, that is a very powerful thing. Rather than being the 30 second interruption in a show, they can be uh, the, the actual, the provider, the, the Bocelli family that is funding the content that is allowing the Degrassi world to expand and grow. Whether that's Playtex and Webisode content, we, uh, Pepsi Refresh was integrated into an interactive storytelling application, mobile app for iOS that we did with Degrassi as well. And these kinds of things are gaining such traction. I'll give you an extreme example. Uh, we did a program with Coca-Cola. It's actually live right now. They're in their second year called, um, with much music, called Coke Covers. And that was an acknowledgement that our audience, whenever a new big song, Katy Perry or what have you, they were sitting in front of their computer and recording covers. There were certain fans that had shot themselves covering songs that had 30 million views. So we looked at it from a much music standpoint and said that's a, a key way in which music is relevant with youth. And we, we, we basically offered the opportunity for the much brand to curate that. Coke became uh, the big partner around that. We didn't actually produce a single piece of content. We curated YouTube. Uh, and it and it generated millions upon millions of page views on Much.com. Well, that's great. I mean, I think that's awesome when you can take user-generated content. I mean, brands are definitely tipping their toes into this space, and, and Coca-Cola got dumped into it when the guys did the, uh, the, the drop that thing in inside the Coke bottle and it fizzes off <laughs> yeah. and oh, takes yeah, yeah, off. Yeah. You know, they ended up hiring them to do some stuff for them. But how do you, you know, for a, for a brand to get into that space, it's very easy for them to say, I'm going to buy 7 o'clock against this program on a Friday night because I know what the audience is. But when you start saying, okay, let's do stuff online, let's do apps, let's do mobile, how do you guarantee an audience reach against that? Mm -hmm. I mean, does anybody have any experience on that where you can say, I'm going to be able to say, you're going to get... X amount of GRP because, I mean, we talked about this just a minute ago, Nielsen's have just launched in the U.S. a cross-study between Nielsen uh, and uh, GR GRPs uh, with uh, Comscore, or not, sorry, Nielsen and uh, online and television and be able to compare online reach. And, you know, Confucius once said, if you can't measure it, you can't sell it. Mm -hmm. So how do you... You know, guarantee well, one, that. one component as it relates to brand's involvement in content is that 
what social has provided over the past four or five years has enabled a brand to establish their own distribution with their audience base. So what does Coke do now that they have 10 million, 10 million fans on Facebook? They can now program to that 10 million person fan base and they have essentially an audience base just like a broadcaster would. So that does mean a shift in terms of in turn, uh, to content production. Coke is a great example. They've been many times a leader in marketing insights. Just released their content 2020 plan that basically outlined that they're going to be investing millions upon millions of dollars into web video production to support their social media channels. Uh, so that's kind of an opportunity where our partnership with Epitome is addressing a need from our, our advertising partners to be in and around content so that they have something to say to their fan base beyond get 25% off our product. Right. So that, okay, so let's talk about social media for a moment when it comes to actually the content itself and not the brand. So when you're utilizing, I mean, Steven, you were talking about you're utilizing your, your character's Twitter, uh, and I know, Maria, you've done some stuff in this space. What, you know, how do you, how do you convert that audience? Well, I mean, how are you converting, are, do you have a, you know, you said you don't have a specific strategy, but there must be some sort of strategy in regards to being able to uh, convert the Facebook audience to a viewing audience. You know, what's that conversion process? I think when we look at new media, we really separate out the distribution piece, which I started with first, uh, where we were talking about how we distribute our existing content, and the, uh, the social media side, which is the engagement piece, because they're, they're related, but they're not the same thing. And so when we look at what we would do on the social media side of things, we're, we're very aggressive in that regard, and we believe that there is a tremendous amount of marketing that we can generate for our shows and our talent um, and our overall brands through social media much like our clients would, our advertisers. So there is a common theme around, you know, how are people utilizing all of these different social media tools to engage your audiences in different ways. And um, so for us, it's really dependent on the content. I think in our kids vertical, we're probably the most aggressive because everyone knows uh, all kids are ADHD now. So they're multitasking and doing a million different things. And that's actually how they're engaged. Um, and, and so we're definitely there providing them the games that they can play along with the show. Um, um, and then tying that back to the broadcast experience as well and putting the rankers up on the screen and putting their names beside that to give them some kind of payoff uh, and keeping them with the linear because we are really in the position of managing sort of these legacy businesses, right? So we, we did touch about on, on that a little bit. You know, when Coke can go out and create a Facebook page and get X million uh, of friends and then market to them directly with content that they're going to be creating, it's an interesting challenge when, when, when we're also asking, to, to your point earlier, them to put some ad dollars against a, a, a piece of content that we've developed on an app that is unproven. Um, it's, it's a real challenge when you're looking at those spends. So we are managing our, 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 our legacy linear businesses uh, in a way where we are using social media to engage and reach out much like our clients do, um, and then also managing the distribution piece to make sure we're there. And, and so, so if I could just add um, two points to that, because I think your question is the question of the day and we're certainly facing it this year. I'd, I'd like to make two points. The first is, your question implies that there actually is a strategy and that we're all brighter than we really are. Uh, the truth is that we're just out there desperately trying every little thing we can, and if it happens to work, then we take credit for being a genius, and if it doesn't, we try and forget about it. But the second aspect that we are asking ourselves right now is, how do we unify all these different things we're doing? How do we... Um, gather together. We've got three million fans on Facebook. Well, that's nice, but how do we engage those fans back to the app or back to tweeting more about the show, back to watching the show more, back to buying Playtex? And we think we've come up with something that we can't uh, talk about right now, or maybe, Chris, you can talk a little bit more about it, in partnership with Much Music, where we're going to try a strategy to make all of the different silos at least aware of each other and more of a synergy, so at least we can gather everyone into one space and then hopefully super engage them and then uh, hopefully do the things that the broadcaster wants to do, which is get more viewers, do the thing that the advertiser wants to do, which is to sell more product. You know, it's interesting. I've seen a lot. Of, I've been kind of delving into the whole Facebook social strategies when it comes to television viewing and driving audience. And we've worked with a partner in the U.S. who's done a huge amount of work with Glee and X Factor and X Number Television and driving that viewership back to on a, on a cost per view basis. 
also on a cost per like basis. But then they take it to the next level, which is really touching on what you're saying about how they can take a fan base of 3 million, 5 million, 10 million people and basically say, all right, now we've got, own, we've got these fans. What are they worth? How can we monetize these? And how do we deliver them back to the advertiser? And they're able to do that by being able to deliver, you know, celebrity endorsements, going to the product, delivering that out back. back. So there's, there are some solutions out there through several APIs that can deliver this back and they're not in Canada yet or they are just touching border here now. Um, what, what about, um, you know, um, Chris, working with, uh, you know, branded cross content, multi-platform experience, kind of, you know, give, give us a, a specific example of some of the integration that you've done um, that has, you know, uh, you were talking about Coca-Cola, correct? Um, what about kind of where it involves on the music front? So being able to involve labels or bands or artists, uh, just touching on, you know, because we're backing onto a music conference here, and I just want to touch on the music side of things, especially given the fact that you have a much music brand, and kind of building the artist into that as well. As I think of an example on the fly, I'll say that regardless of the advertiser, uh, why they come to us, they can still build their own content, they can serve their own channels. Why they come to Much Music for music or MTV for sexy lifestyle or space uh, or discovery, they're coming to us because our brand and our programming has a, a cultural resonance that they need to uh, align their product with. We, they're fishing where the fish are. So why we're confident as to where things go, where brands are producing their own content, we know that ultimately uh, being in the TV business and the entertainment business, the impression business, that we'll be able to continue to partner with clients. So to give you an example more in this instance in fashion, uh, uh, Clean and Clear wanted to get involved more in the fashion space and rather than enlisting and building a 15 person editorial team, they uh, built a fashion blog called Fora with MTV and we built this whole vertical, fashion vertical, from scratch in partnership with Clean and Clear. Uh, there are other instances with uh, Blackberry, for example, where they actually wanted to position themselves against music with much music, where we built a full concert vertical that uh, was optimized for Blackberries. So no matter the client, we're basically just, our, we're in the business of aligning their business objectives with our entertainment objectives and finding a way to deliver value to the user that is entertaining while still getting the brand message across. Steven, um, on the music front, you use a lot of music, a lot of Canadian independent music um, across your program, across multi-platforms, um, and as a win-win scenario for the artist and yourself. Can you kind of describe what that scenario is and how you use the multi-platform and use the rights so that at the end of the day, Obviously, you're benefiting, but can the, how does the artist and, and uh, the rights management benefit? Well, absolutely. We use about 200, on Degrassi alone, we use about 200 pieces of outside music each year, and the vast majority of it is independent Canadian artists, and it's fantastic music. So, I mean, it benefits us immediately because we get to use great music in our show. We do pay a license fee to the artist and to the songwriter for the right to do it. It's not a huge license fee, so that's not the reason the artist would be as interested, but we are able to, pr to provide a few other things. One, Degrassi is in up to 150 countries around the world, and so they're getting their music out into other territories of the world and being known in a way that um, they wouldn't otherwise. But more important than that, we work with people like Much Music in Canada and Teen Nick and MTV in the United States, so when the show is run, two things happen. One, at the end of the show, one of the artists will get a five-second block saying, music in this episode featured Whale Tooth and the such a song, play a little bit of the song and direct you to, say, the Much Music site where all the songs are listed with click-throughs to iTunes and to the band's webpage. Well, all of a sudden then, you've got everybody helping each other out. We're getting great music, we're, make, we're making a better show, and the artists and the songwriters are getting uh, promotional benefits in ways that they never could have before. Jenna, what about yourself? You know, taking a, a cinematic approach from things and a filmmaker approach, a uh, film distribution approach, because obviously every film has music and a lot of films have albums that they lo it, it launches artists. Um, so, from I think the interesting thing here is out of the four of us, I'm the only purebred startup. 
Um, and so it's interesting to hear these examples from like proven brands, whether it's brand associations or proven content brands. So since each of our films are brand new, we don't have that problem of being a proven brand and we're trying to prove ourselves every time out of the gate. So an issue that hasn't come up for you guys, that's a big issue for us, um, is discovery. So it's one thing to be putting all the content on these multiple uh, platforms and, you know, in our perspective, putting the content on the right platform. But it's another thing to actually have people discover that content when they don't know the film or they may know the cast or they may be comfortable with the genre. So our challenge is having that marketing discovery process each time. Now, I will say that while we're focused on independent content, some of that content's documentary, some is narrative. We do have several verticals that we focus on, and one of those is music. And the interesting thing about music is it helps us on the discovery problem. So we had a movie that we released about this time last year called This Movie is Broken, uh, Broken Social Scene. And um, that was really interesting because we had like built-in marketing hooks. So on our team, we look for that in all of the content. So since we don't have the strengths of here, we're like, well, what do we have working for us? What is it? Is there a hook? Is there a known commodity of some kind? And then once we identify what that is, then that helps us inform what our multi-platform marketing strategy is going to be, as well as the, the programming piece of it. And I will just add one thing, even though we are in our startup phase, we have had one really interesting uh, partnership with a Unilever brand, Bertoli. Um, and it was something where we did have to guarantee impressions. And we were in a position of basically producing original content, but offering access. So as a film company, many, many brands are often in the same way here at Music Week, brands latch on to conferences or to festivals. And so Sundance is a really big deal, obviously, in the, in the film space. And so Bertoli was already at, you know, had committed to be at Sundance. We took them a step further since our strengths are relationships with filmmakers. Whether the filmmaker happens to do anything else, we have the access to the filmmaker. And we, you know, kind of brought Bertoli inside and together with them have now, I think it's not running here, but it's running on a few of the cable channels in the States. It's like little interviews that we've done with Bertoli where we're kind of talking to a director and talking about, you know, how, why they made their film or whatever. It was very interesting for Bertoli to do that. We gave them very good metrics because we could measure it instantly. What were the impressions? How did that work? And for us, it was our kind of first experience as a, as a baby startup, um, getting into this world and figuring out how do we, how do we work with brands and, and what does that look like? So I will end on that note saying, even if from a startup position, trying to figure out how we incorporate brands, how we can be a responsible partner is something we've been thinking about for a long time. How, uh, um, this morning, Maria and Steven, I, well, it's all of you really, but uh, I, uh, how important now is IP rights when you're trying to market your product? You know, I mean, music industry is very concerned about IP, everyone is, but the film industry has been very good at teasing the product out and, and, and Janet touched on the fact of creating original content while you're creating the content. So utilizing, you know, behind the scenes footage as opposed to just simply doing some pre-interviews prior to the show coming out, you know, which is, you know, a very traditional model, but actually, you know, utilizing some, you know, I, I, and I've seen it with some of the, uh, you know, HBO programming, Game of Thrones, there's some cool stuff going on at AMC. They're doing some very cool behind the scenes stuff to get their programming out there and get it marketed. You know, how are we doing that from a Canadian perspective? Well, I'll speak to, so Chorus has uh, two divisions, Kid Cans Press and Nelvana. And in both those instances, we would own IP uh, for assets we created. And one of the ones, we, so we talk about transmedia, uh, Scaredy Squirrel, which we touched on before the panel. Uh, Scaredy Squirrel is this uh, book. Uh, it's a crazy it, squirrel. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a family version of the Adam Films uh, version, which was uh, Happy Tree Friends. Which, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's really great. I love so it. So we've, we've taken that book asset uh, and, and made it into a television show, and that's just one example uh, of many that we have. Um, but when you own the IP, and particularly in the kids' realm, uh, a big component of that IP process is merch. 
So looking at um, those assets and how do they translate across all, all of the, the distribution, typical video distribution uh, worlds, and, and as well, how do they translate into the physical world uh, in toy. Another great example we have is Beyblade, uh, where it's, it's a huge success. And so not only is it a TV show, and is it apps, is it games, it's also the big merch drive. Uh, and the World Championships for Beyblade is coming to Course Key, our main office, uh, in, in a, on the Saturday, I believe. So it's, it's, it's engaging on all those different levels and IP is a huge piece of that. Um, when we buy rights, so you mentioned HBO, a lot of times we don't necessarily get all of those great ancillary digital assets that in the US they use to market these shows. We do fortunately benefit from a lot of the noise that's created in the States. Like HBO, I think they told us the number on average spends $15 million on the launch of any of their big shows, so Game of Thrones would be one. Let me tell you, our budgets are a fraction of that here for the entire service, so uh, let alone show by show. But we do get some of the knock-on ancillary sp spillover from that. Then sharing some of the cart, uh, like sharing some of that content out that you have the rights to be able to do that with, right? right? And and that's free marketing in a sense. So sorry, explain that. What do you mean? So uh, using your trailers, creating content, using yeah. some of the stuff from the U.S. I mean, I would think that you know, as an example, some of the content that they create. Sure, the normal thing. But I think some of the deep engagement experiences you're talking about, uh, the killing is one that people use as a great case study as yeah. well. They did tremendous online uh, digital engagement stuff up front before the launch of that show. You know, in Canada, when you buy a show, you don't necessarily get to own that and launch the marketing programs uh, as part of it. So that's an interesting piece for us. But a unique twist on, you know, we talk about all the different windows. Uh, some of the strategies that were, were utilized in the fall launch uh, that just happened for New Girl, uh, which is a show, they, they pre-released that show on all different platforms before it went to air in order to drive large tune-in and anticipation. They did the same thing for Smash just recently. If anybody flew American Airlines, you couldn't miss it for the week before the show went to air. It was on, on all airplanes as well as online. We're adopting some of those strategies here. Uh, again, where we get the rights and where we get the IP. Well, I mean, you it's interesting. I mean, the, the success of music has come back to television. It's, it's you know, uh, musical television, really, with the success of Glee, uh, Smash coming out now. Um, you know, Canada's got talent on the reality side, you know, duplication of X Factor. What, uh, you know, what type of programming? I mean, Stephen, what, does, I don't know if you get into that world at all on, on the... On the well, no, we produced a program, it was one of my favorite series, Instant Star, which was very much, uh, you know, so the, the Glee smash era. I did, just picking up um, on Maria, what you were talking about, we are not into the merchandising side, um, but also we feel that our strength, we know what our strength is, and that is producing a certain kind of programming, pro we call it programming with heart. Uh, so we enter into partnerships on all these other activities that we do. Uh, we want to own the copyright in the end to this, not because we want to monetize that directly ourselves, but if we produce a webisode and we've got the rights to that webisode for other uses or outside that territory, we can put it as a bonus feature on a DVD. Uh, we do behind the scenes uh, practically every day. We've got somebody in our office shooting behind the scenes that we can package as extras to give away on the, on the game that we're, uh, you know, that much music is promoting or that we can, you know, give as rewards to fans, you know, secret behind the scenes if they do certain things. Things. So we're very aware of wanting to have um, the copyright and the IP rights in these things that are being produced. But it's not because we directly are trying to say, oh, we can monetize that. Again, we come back to how can we use that to further engage and further make our partners uh, happier because if they're happy, then we're going to be happy in the end because we'll keep on producing Degrassi until, you know, the next uh, 50 years. Uh, talking about multi-platform, we haven't really touched on uh, creating apps. So I mean, that's it's the hottest, it's the hot thing right now. iPad 4 just came out. A lot of changes to it. There's some funny videos online about that. Uh, I, I think it's three actually. It's uh, three. iPhone 10, iPad 3. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, what type of apps are you developing to be able to, you know, not only from uh, to market the product. Um, but also distribute the product and then eventually monetize it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, one example that ties together work with Degrassi is we built an interactive story-based game that enables you to register as a student at Degrassi. This is for iOS. 
uh, and you essentially make all of the choices that you would as a student at Degrassi in a kind of choose your own adventure format. Based on the decisions that you make within the game, impacts your popularity uh, and social ranking within the school. Just like life. And just like life. Except <laughs> nowhere near as cruel. Um, Stephen, do you, I don't know if you want to build on that at all. Um, well, yes, and again, this idea, uh, it wasn't just a game that wasn't related to Degrassi. It goes to the very core value. Again, it was engagement. How do you engage? Well, you become a student at Degrassi. That's a way to engage. And one of the things that we're working on um, is more of a co-viewing app, which again comes at uh, a different kind of engagement, mm -hmm. which, uh, and that'll be launched uh, later, later this year, yeah. where how do we engage the person who's watching, but they're also on Twitter, mm -hmm. and they're also emailing with their friends, how do we engage them even further? Um, and that's, I, I keep coming back to what I said at the beginning, why are we doing it? We're trying to drive engagement. And the easiest way to do this is to, I mean, taking co-viewing as an example, uh, the easiest way that we've found to build into new platforms is to look at the activities that are already taking place. So for example, co-viewing is just built on the basis, we're programming boredom, we're programming ADD, and I guess it's best to start with much music, although most people have probably been tweeting and uh, checking their email throughout this whole panel uh, anyways. I left my Blackberry and I left my watch, so I, my watch so is my Blackberry, but I've been told I think we're cutting short here. Yeah. Uh, do we have time for any questions? or? All right, does anybody have any, uh, step up to the microphone, anybody have any uh, questions they'd like to uh, throw out to the panel? We're good. Um, all right, well, you know what, just, uh, I, I want to wrap up and say thank you very much to the panel, it was great. Um, and. Uh,